So our next speaker is uh, Jeremy Costell, who will be talking about uh, solvability of TASEP and its applications. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for the chance to speak. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, solvability of TASEP. And uh, here are my collaborators. And uh, the plan of the, uh, of the talk was to show everybody the uh, formula for the TASEP transition probabilities and then go through some applications um, to the one, two, three scaling limit to get the uh, KPZ fixed point, the large deviations uh, for TASEP, and then a comparison method uh, to show that the KPZ equation converges to the KPZ fixed point. Uh, so given the, uh, the time constraint, uh, we'll see about the applications anyway. Um, stop me if you have questions. So, uh, so let's start. Uh, I think everybody knows what TASEP is, but let me just uh, go over it quickly. Uh, so TASEP, the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process, you can think either of particles on Z uh, in the integers. There's either a particle or not a particle at each site. And the particles, it's in continuous time, and the particles are attempting jumps to the right, uh, nearest neighbor, at rate one. And the jump only happens if there's nobody in the way. Uh, but you could also think of it as a height function. Uh, the height function is a simple random walk path, which goes up whenever there's a particle and goes down when there's no particle. And so you're staring at the state space. Uh, there's one little twist, which is that in our solvable TASEP, there's a rightmost particle. Uh, so there's no particles after this uh, particle x1. Uh, or for the height function, it just goes down after a while. But that can be sort of as far to the right as you want, so it doesn't really make that much difference. Okay, and the dynamics, as I said, is the particles are trying to jump, and as the particles jump, the height function just flips down. So it's equivalent either to think of the height function, where little local maxima jump to little local minima at rate one, or the particles jumping. So I think everybody's seen this. Uh, um, so let me just uh, show you the formula, and then we'll, we'll discuss where the formula comes from. Here's the formula. <laughs> so let's take a few minutes uh, to stare at this slide. So the, um, the formula is a formula for the finite dimensional distributions of the TASEP, um, starting from any uh, configuration. So it's a formula for the transition probabilities, because of course, if I want to know uh, the distribution at some time t, it's enough to know the finite dimensional distributions of the thing. Uh, the formula for the x's, the x's is almost like an inverse function of the heights, and so the positions of the particles. And uh, so this is also a formula for the finite dimensional distributions of the height function at time t, though I've written it in terms of the positions of the particles. Uh, so the positions of the particles at time t are called x1 t, uh, ordered from the right, that's just a tradition. And you wanna look at the at M of those particles at time T, and that corresponds to the uh, M fold distributions, the M point distributions of the height function at time T is just a translation of that. So, um, so these transition probabilities are given by uh, determinants and there's a recipe which you start with your initial TSAP particles, x0, 1, x0, 2, et cetera. And out of that, you construct a kernel K or an operator, depending on how you like to think about it. But we're thinking of operators as defined by their integral kernels, for which you take the Fredholm determinant, and that Fredholm determinant produces your transition probabilities. So there's a little recipe from initial distributions to operators, which is being described here. So what's the K? The K is an M by M matrix kernel. So we're going to look at the ijth entry of it because it's acting on an M fold product of little l2. And um, so what are the ingredients that go into it? Well, there's a thing called Q. And Q is nothing but the uh, transition probabilities of a uh, geometric random walk jumping down. OK, so that's this little Q. and um, it happens that this Q is actually invertible. The inverse is just a, uh, a bidiagonal matrix. It's a simple thing. And, um, and so I could take Q to this power nj minus ni 
it doesn't matter what the sine of nj minus ni is. The other things that are sitting inside this formula are a extension of q called q bar, which is, um, you should think of it as a kind of analytic extension of it, it of, of the q. So q, of course, is zero for positive jumps because it's a geometric jump walk jumping down. But what q bar does is it kind of extends the q into the negative region as a, uh, sorry, into the positive region as a polynomial. So that's this q bar. And then there are these e to the t grad minuses, which are just generators. Grad minus is just the discrete difference operator. Grad minus of f is just f of x minus f of x minus 1. So it's just the negative discrete difference operator. So these are just uh, generators of uh, Poisson processes. And the one other thing, the most important thing here, is this tau, which is the hitting time of a geometric random walk jumping down. And it's the first time it hits strictly above function produced by the initial condition, x0n. Remember, x0n is actually decreasing also. So you have a geometric random walk jumping down, chasing a x0n chase, uh, jumping down. And the first time that the, that the bn, this geometric random walk, goes above, strictly above, the initial uh, function produced by the x0ns is this tau. And so that tau goes into the formula, and that produces a formula, and this uh, produces the Tay-Sepp transition probabilities. So the complexity of solving Tay-Sepp is reduced to the computation of first hitting times of discrete curves. OK. So that's the formula. And uh, if there's no questions, I'll just, um, well, <laughs> if there's no questions right now, I'll just go to uh, telling you a little bit about where the formula comes from. So th this formula is uh, always holds. There's, there's no real conditions. Through the formula, TASEP is solved. Um, so where does the formula come from? So uh, you know we're not the first people to give a formula for TASEP. Um, Gunter Schutz gave a formula for n particle to n particle transition probabilities of TASEP. So you start with n particles in certain positions, and you ask where they are at some time t later. I'll show you the formula in a second. Um, but the problem with such a formula is it's not really what you want to, uh, to study TASEP in the large scale, because uh, you're starting with a huge number of particles. And really, what you want to know is where a few particles are later. So if you had to do that, you'd have to take some enormous summation over this, over the particles later, which you didn't care about. And that summation can't be controlled, uh, except in some cases. Um, so one should think that in the wedge initial condition, which means to have all particles packed to the uh, left of the origin initially and all empty sites to the right of the origin, it turns out that this uh, matrix is a toplet structure. And that's essentially why uh, Johansson could study the large end limit and obtain the uh, GUE distribution in that limit. Um, Sasamoto and Borden were able to reduce the problem to uh, a barothagonalization problem, which I'll show you. And, um, and then we were able to solve that barothagonalization problem. So I guess the whole process took about 20 years from Schutz's original formula. And um, after the fact, you can take this uh, formula and literally just plug it into the backward equation uh, for TASEF and check that it works. And the backward equation has a unique solution you can check. And so um, once you know the formula, it may be a slightly hard formula to guess, uh, you can just check that it, uh, that it works. <laughs> OK, and checking that it works is not hard. It relies on about five miracles, which you sort of can't believe as they occur. Uh, and it's it you learn nothing by doing it. it. They're just complete crazy miracles. Okay. Okay. So here's Schutz's formula. So uh, uh, Schutz's formula is, as I said, is an n by n determinant full of contour integrals. Uh, so there's the n by n determinant. The x's and the y's are your initial n positions of the particles, and the final n positions of the particles. Um, and 
you know, these apps are given by some contrary integrals, and uh, I, I won't say much more about it. It's not, well, I'll say a little bit more about it. It's not particularly intuitive formula. And as I said, the formula is not particularly conducive to, um, to, uh, to doing any limits or anything of it, except in the special case of narrow wedge, where you can sort of already see the, the toplet structure a little bit. Um, so where does formula come from? Well, what you do, if, if you look in this uh, contour integral, there's a term which is actually the general solution of uh, free particle evolution. So free particle evolution means just pretend the particles don't see each other and evolve them. And then you just find out what's the general uh, complex analytic solution of the forward equation for a system of n free particles. And now what you do is you think of the interaction as boundary conditions. And so you have to try to match boundary conditions. And when you try to do that, um, you get these things called beta ansatz equations. And these beta ansatz equations actually just produce uh, this determinant for you. And so that's where this uh, formula comes from. It was Sasamoto who realized what one should do with Schutz's formula. He, he saw that these apps satisfy some recursion equation. And then um, trying to simplify the determinant by row reduction, uh, it can actually be rewritten as a kind of determinantal point process on a space of uh, gelfand zeitlin patterns. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it too much. Um, the interest, one of the interesting things here is it's not actually a probabilistic determinantal point process. It is actually a signed determinantal point process. Um, if you have a determinantal point process, then uh, the, um, the largest point in the thing can be given as a Fredholm determinant. And here, although uh, the points are gelfand zetland patterns, there's a similar kind of structure. And so the entire thing is reduced to the computation of this correlation kernel of this signed determinantal point process, which is a kind of matrix uh, inversion problem, which, uh, which you can rephrase as a biorthogonalization problem. So here's the biorthogonalization problem of uh, Sasamoto, Borden, et cetera, and, and company. OK, so maybe on this slide, the best thing to do is look at the bottom of the slide. The last two lines of the slide say that uh, TASEP, now phrased in terms of its height function, but it's really the same thing as the particle positions, which I had earlier. Uh, could be solved is given as a Fredholm determinant of a kernel, if only you could solve the problem above, the algebra problem above. And the algebra problem is that you're given the Charlier polynomials, which are um, the orthogonal polynomials with respect to the Poisson measure on the positive integers. So those things are called Charlier polynomials, and they're, and they're uh, as I've written here, uh, orthogonal polynomials. And now you take your initial particles and you, uh, you shift your initial particles. Remember the initial particles are, are, are going down and you shift them by their label, call those things X hat. Now what you're supposed to do is take uh, one of these sets of Charlier polynomials together with the reference measure and shift that by these X hats and produce a thing called Psi. And now you're supposed to find biorthogonal pairs to these things. And if only you could find these biorthogonal pairs, uh, then you can put it together at the bottom of the slide and produce a kernel. And this kernel is the kernel for TASEP. And so the problem is just reduced to this algebra problem of finding biorthogonal pairs. And you can see that if you were in the uh, wedge initial data, which is the all the particles are to the uh, initially to the left of the origin, then x zero of L is just minus L. And so x hats are just zero. So you've done no shifting. And the biorthogonal pairs are just the original Charlier polynomials. So that's the solvable case. Otherwise, if, the, uh, if you're just given some other x's, uh, it's kind of a hard problem, uh, which one was able to uh, guess the answer to in the uh, flat case, the flat case being that the particle, no particle, particle, no particle, particle, no particle in a box. That's the only other case which one can solve. In fact, it was a very difficult problem already, uh, known open problem to solve particle, particle, whole, whole, particle, particle, whole, whole. So 
Um, so the amazing thing is, is that um, there's a, just a solution to this problem. Um, the um, the phi k's are nothing but the probability that a geometric random walk first hits the epigraph. Epigraph just means the step above a graph, a time k. Uh, as I as I had the same thing that I uh, just showed you. So it's phi k is essentially the the prob the probability that that tau is equal to k from the previous thing. And once one puts it all together, one gets the, uh, the formula on the, that I showed you. Okay, so that's the, uh, the solution of case up. Okay, so now let's, um, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, maybe I'll just talk about one or two of the applications. Um, so, uh, so for case up, um, you know, there's there's a couple of important scaling limits that one would like to try to take. One is the uh, Euler scaling limit, which I think everybody here is familiar with. So you, one can either take these limits in terms of the height function or in terms of the density of particles, which I call u. U, of course, is just the derivative of h, essentially, the spatial derivative of h. Um, and so one has one can do Euler scaling in which case one expects the u to converge to the Berger's equation. And what solution of the Berger's equation? Well, the entropy solution of the Berger's equation, and that's known. Um, so that was proved already about 30 years ago by uh, various people. I'll, I'll just, so there's probably other people in the audience who proved versions of this. Uh, so it was quite a few different results, but uh, I guess the definitive results were by uh, Freydun and Timo um, for the entropy solution in general. And the other interesting limit that one has is to look at a longer scale, uh, but of course, starting with uh, much smaller initial data. And um, so at this one, two, three scale, which I've written lower down here, um, so now you start with initial data, which is supposed to diffusively scale instead of hyperbolically scale. Well, the, in, in the hyperbolic scaling, you're not really re having the U initially rescaled at all. Um, then um, then uh, you're supposed to see uh, this very interesting KPZ fixed point. Okay, so first uh, let me tell you, so, so, so now these things are, are are achievable just by using the exact formula. So you take a limit of the exact formula, which I showed you, and in the one, two, three scaling limit, you get this formula for the KPZ fixed point. So the formula should be familiar from the earlier formula, but now everything's been rescaled into continuous space and the geometric random walks have become Brownian motions. So the the scale the, the 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 if you look at the earlier formula and try to rescale it to this, it's very transparent. The each term in the earlier formula scales to the terms here. So the KPZ fixed point is a is a special uh, invariant Markov process which sits in the middle of the KPZ universality class and has hiding in it all the famous you know uh, GUE and GOE Tracy Whittem distributions and things like that. Um, its uh, transition probabilities are, are given here. So the height function, uh, so it's a, it, it's, a, it's a Markov process of evolving height functions. You, you could just take a derivative and have it as evolving u's instead, but I'm writing it like this. It wants to be written like this. So you start with an initial height function h0, and it, this tells you the finite dimensional distributions of your ht are given by, um, Fredholm determinants, and there's a recipe given your h0 and your time t and your x's and your a's, how to construct a kernel whose Fredholm determinants are these funny dimensional distributions of the transition probability. Now, if you look at this kernel k, the, the recipe is, is, has a very nice structure. Again, it's a matrix kernel, just the same as before. There's a kind of core kernel, kh0, um, so you're given your H0, you kind of construct this KH0, which is uh, what we call the Brownian scattering transform. I'll describe in a second. Once you've constructed that, the evolution in the T's and X's and A's, if you want to think about it like that, is entirely trivial. 
It's just by conjugation by these differential operators. So you can think that you lift your initial data up onto the land of operators. And then up in the land of operators, the evolution is really just a straight line, if you like. It's a linear evolution. And then you project down through your Fredholm determinant to get your transition probability. So that makes this thing a completely integrable Markov process. And so what I have to tell you is uh, how you get this uh, KH0 from your initial data. And that's through this hit operator. So um, the operator is just defined by its kernel. And so you have a Brownian motion starting at U1 at time minus L. And you ask it to go to U2 at time L. And in between, hit below your initial data H0. Things have gotten flipped a little because you went from the X representation to the H representation. And this is called the hit operator and um, or the hit kernel and of course you can wonder whether this hit kernel defines the h0 and it does uh it's not obvious at all and now um if you want to go to the full space what you do is you solve your heat equation backwards on either side and then pull the thing out as l goes to infinity and that produces for you this uh, Brownian scattering transform. Now that's written a little bit informally because the the hit operator is not actually analytic in uh, u1 or u2 so solving the heat equation backwards is not completely justified here except that as long as t is not equal to zero the uh, e to the t d cubed is so smoothing that it comes in and saves you. And so the entire operator k is perfectly well defined, although the way I've written it is a little bit informal. OK. And, and it's well defined. And, and, and in fact, the kernels of these things are completely explicit. Uh, I just didn't write them out. They're just complicated things full of area functions. And this map from h0 into the operator land is actually a, a beautiful continuous injection from, from functions into the trace class. It, it's, um, one has to think of upper semi-continuous functions because there's initial data like uh, narrow wedge. As you take your wedge initial data for, for a case up uh, and you take a limit, it actually converges to a very narrow wedge, which is actually the function, which is just zero at zero and minus infinity everywhere else. So, so such functions are kind of natural things. And in fact, those are the ones where you can calculate your, your k. So that narrow wedge, the k, it, it doesn't take too long to understand that it's actually just a projection operator. And you could also calculate it for flat. It's a reflection operator. And then you just unravel this whole thing, and you get the GUE and GUE tracy Whittem distributions. OK. And in fact, if you have a, um, a, a, uh, a Fredholm determinant like this with a kernel, which is depending on t's and x's in a nice way, you're very tempted to differentiate the log of the determinant in the t's and x's because the derivative of the log of the determinant is just a trace. And when you do that, you discover that the finite dimensional distributions of the KPZ fixed point actually satisfy equations. In fact, they're um, famous integrable equations uh, uh, from integrable partial differential equations. So um, the, the n dimensional distributions of the KPZ fixed point are actually the, the log derivatives of these things. Uh, are traces of matrices, which are the solutions of the um, matrix KP equation, the matrix Carter Karamsev Petrasvili equation, um, which is written here. And um, yeah, I mean, looking at the thing for a second isn't going to help you so much, but maybe just look in one dimension. In one dimension, it just says that the second log derivative satisfies the classic cutoffs of Petrasvili equation, which is written here. Uh, and if you like, the simplest case of this is that if you start with flat initial data, the, uh, the second log derivative of the distribution function at one point satisfies KDV, which is kind of a fun and not very well explained fact. Um, the Tracy-Widham distributions actually 
you can just check, uh, follow it immediately because there's special self-similarity structure of the uh, narrow wedge and flat initial data. You know that they just uh, scale in a certain way. And so you just plug that into the KP equation and out pops the classic uh, Panlevé representations of the uh, tracy Whittem distributions. Uh, maybe because we're a little bit short of time, I won't, uh, I don't know how much, <laughs> Kavita, how much time do I have? Because I don't know when I started. Um, um, I think you can go for another th three minutes, three to three, four minutes. Three minutes, okay, fine. Okay. I'll, um, <laughs> I'll just point out that the these, Everything I've said is for deterministic initial data. Um, there are spotty results here and there for uh, non-deterministic initial data, though nobody understands them in particular. Uh, my student, Sincheng Zhang, uh, actually checked Brownian initial data. And uh, lo and behold, the antiderivative of the one-point distribution satisfies the KP equation. Um, why that's true is anybody's guess. Um, of course, why the KP is, equations are true is anybody's guess also. Um, uh, let me just, because I have three minutes, I'll just mention another one more application, then I'll stop. I guess this is a big thing to say in three minutes, but um, if you look at the Berger's limit for TASEP, uh, then there was this famous uh, problem of trying to calculate the large deviations. Um, the, you're supposed to see an entropy solution of the Berger's equation. So you ask, what's the probability to see a non-entropy weak solution of the Berger's equation? And um, uh, Varadhan and Jensen conjectured that this uh, would, the large deviations for such a weak non-entropy solution would be governed by what's called the Khrushchev entropy production, which is written here. The, they were able to prove a uh, upper bound, uh, but only a lower bound in a few special cases. But once one has an exact formula, uh, one can actually go all the way. And we were able to prove the full theorem. In fact, it's a little bit funny. The, the, it's, although we, we prove matching upper and lower bounds, the, the upper bound that we prove is actually a little bit stronger than the uh, jensen Veridan. Uh, upper bounds. So, so there's sort of a result in both directions. Um, and the one thing I want to say is that proving um, this large deviation is definitely not immediate from the exact formula for a couple of reasons, which are kind of amusing. Um, one is that the um, formula for TASEP tells you the probability that the height function lies below something. For large deviations, you want to ask the probability that the height function lies in a little tube around some function. Don't worry that, it, that I'm writing the thing in terms of the derivative of the height function, because you can just rephrase the uh, jensen varian conjecture in terms of the height functions themselves. Um, so uh, getting a tube probability from, from an upper bound probability well, it looks like kind of in principle easy, but actually you have to use inclusion exclusion formula. And that is not so simple when you're dealing with uh, functions, which are, you know, continuous functions. The, um, but there's an even deeper problem, which is that the type of uh, lar uh, asymptotics which you're doing here become asymptotics on a Fredholm determinant where the kernel is not in the, it, it, a Fredholm determines easy to study its asymptotics when you're in the regime where a kernel is getting small, because then you're, you're you know, the determinant of i minus k and k is getting small, so the thing's close to one, but that's not the asymptotics which is being done here. The asymptotics being done here is actually deep inside where the kernel is not uh, just going to zero in a simple case. And so what one has to do is an enormous trace expansion and understand how, Cancellations in this trace correspond to the geometry of the problem of uh, weak uh, non-entropy solutions. I, I guess I'll stop there because we're out of time and just ask, leave it for questions. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank Jeremy. The interest of time, maybe if there's one quick question, I don't see any in the chat. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Pablo. Pablo, hi. How are you? Good. Nice, really nice talk. Uh, I, so you mentioned that only works for uh, 
deterministic initial conditions. Uh, are these uh, regular things like uh, periodic or you can take an arbitrary configuration initially? Right. So, so this formula is true for any initial condition which has a rightmost particle. So, and, and so, you know, that rightmost particle can be as far to the right as you want. So essentially it's for any, any initial condition, but it's a deterministic initial condition. Otherwise you don't have the formula. Do you see? Of course you can just, for, for random initial data, you can write a formula which says, you know, the probability is given by the integral of this random determinant against your initial measure. But it's not much of a formula because the, do you know what I mean? Because the, um, the K depends on your initial data. And so it doesn't seem to be very useful. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. But then miraculously, for a few special random initial data, there's a formula of this nature. <laughs> and nobody understands why, well, you understand algebraically, but you don't understand, is that just those couple of ones or it, are there other ones, but we just don't know how to find them. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you very much, Jeremy, for a very nice talk. Let's thank Jeremy. Again.